Okay, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. We're gonna go ahead and get started. My name is Chantelle Warner. I'm one of the two co-directors of Circle, your hosts for today. Um, on behalf of myself and my Circle colleagues, we're just really happy to welcome you to today's webinar. Um, with me today is also Kate Mackay, our Associate Director, and Marisol Aguirre, who's our Outreach Coordinator. And we'll be working with you in the chat. If you have any questions or troubleshooting, go ahead and post those there. So for those of you who are new to Circle, I want to just introduce ourselves briefly. We're the Center for Educational Resources and Culture, Language and Literacy, and we're housed at the University of Arizona and the College of Humanities, but we're one of 16 language resource centers um, as part of a larger program. And our mission is to basically support language educators. We provide a lot of other professional learning opportunities, uh, materials, and other resources on our website. So if you haven't done this before, um, please do go ahead and after the webinar, check us out and see the other things that we have to offer. And I also encourage you to check out the other 15 language resource centers. Uh, we work together, but with different areas of emphasis. Um, and if you go look there, you'll find a lot of really valuable resources and materials for those in language education. Want to go ahead and tell you about a couple of the upcoming events that we have. So one is the Second Language Multimodal Literacies or L2ML Symposium that we have coming up in April. This is a fully virtual event, so you can participate from anywhere in the world. And we have uh, three really exciting invited speakers, Denise Newfield, Anna Oscaz, and Jennifer Rossell. And then we're also going to have a, a wide variety of submitted papers. We'll be releasing that program really soon. So have a look for it and a look for that registration. It's going to be a really exciting event and I think relates actually very closely in some ways to the webinar that we have today. Uh, we also, even though this is a year away, we want you to go ahead and start saving the date for the next Intercultural Learning um, Global Citizenship and Peacebuilding Conference, uh, which is our ninth international conference on the development and assessment of intercultural competence. And we're going to be very, very soon here releasing a uh, list of the invited plenary speakers and a call for papers. This will be coming out really, really soon. So this is just sort of a keep, keep looking for it announcement and go ahead and save that date. And that's going to be a hybrid event. So we'll be happy to welcome some of you to Tucson, but there'll also be possibilities for participating virtually. And then back for the first time since the since, in a few years, we're going to have our in-person um, language teacher symposium or lattes, as we call it. And that event is going to be uh, coming up here in May. And our first speaker will be Melanie Mello, who's an award-winning language teacher who's here from Arizona. And she'll be uh, leading a workshop on performance-based activities for the world language classroom. So if you're here local in Arizona or the area, um, please come and join us. And we'll look forward to working with you. And then finally, this webinar is actually part of a larger series that we've been hosting this year that's on multiliteracy takes on language teaching. We have one more event coming up in March, which is Elise Petit, who will be talking about nurturing creativity and agency in second languages through digital storytelling projects. Um, so please do come and join us for that event as well. And if you missed any of the other previous webinars, we do have all those videos posted on our website, where we'll also be posting today's event uh, once we get it in a, in a beautiful working fashion. And we'll get that up there. So that brings us to our main event for today, um, learning at, from, and within learning at, from, and with the Art Museum, a multiliteracies perspective. Um, I'm really, really delighted to have with us today Christelle Papakuerli. She's an associate teaching professor in language education at Rutgers Graduate School of Education. And she's worked extensively on uh, community engaged language education, working with language educators as scholars, teachers, um, and working as an advocate for equity, social justice, and solidarity in language education. Um, her work is situated at the intersections of language teacher education, the arts, and community engagement. And I think that's something we'll be seeing very prominently in the webinar she has for us today. And her work really emphasizes place-based and material and multiliteracies pedagogical approaches in, in really rich and exciting ways. Her work has been published in Foreign Language Annals, the L2 Journal, International Journal of Multilingual Education, um, Nectal Review, and Language Teaching Research. And she's currently working on a book that I'm really excited about already that explores language teacher education at and with the Art Museum. And so we're gonna get a little, I think a sneak preview in some ways of that book today in the webinar. Um, so please join me in welcoming Christelle Papakoeli. Thank you, Chantelle. Thank you, uh, everyone. I'm delighted to be here uh, with you today and um, to see that everyone is coming from different spaces, different places. So welcome. 
Thank you for joining this webinar. Um, it's always wonderful to come together, to think, to talk, to learn together. Um, and I also wanted to thank uh, Circle and Chantel for this nice introduction, for offering this opportunity to be together in this virtual space. Um, so today we're going to go to the museum together. And let me just tell you how I came to do this work. Um, in the summer, and it's been a couple of summers, um, I walk, talk, and learn with teachers of French, mostly, at the museum. I began uh, working with a program at the Louvre Museum in Paris, and then this work grew into collaborations with the teachers across sites of practice, with community-based organizations and my colleagues at my university. Um, in the US and in France and working at, but also with and through sometimes against museums and their texts um, has also become a central piece in my work, um, but also in my life. Um, and so really before this first summer, um, when I walked into the Louvre Museum to learn with and from language teachers, but also museum educators and staff, I really wasn't like a regular museum visitor. I certainly was an art amateur and I still proudly remain ever since. Um, but I also felt like some of the tensions and some of the, the inaccessibility of those spaces. Um, and then it really seemed that um, museums were shrouded in a sort of in mystery and certainly in elitism. Um, and so, but after this first encounter, and especially the Louvre Museum, which is one of those um, so-called universal museums, there's a lot of, um, it's complicated working within, um, within such a space. I started to look for ways of looking, maybe ways of seeing also, and ways of writing ourselves um, into the galleries or in the, the margins of those texts as well. And I became interested in the learning opportunities that we, language educators, um, could create for ourselves and mostly for our students in the galleries. Because in the choices that we make, um, the ways we interact with texts, with places, and with each other, those configurations, the social, pedagogical, um, doesn't have to stay this way. And they can be, they are very flexible and they, do not have to be taken for granted. So I also started to look for possibilities in looking sideways uh, in the margins of encounters with museum texts and galleries, trying to capture, maybe sometimes map out um, the emerging, the unpredictable literacy encounters in the galleries um, of museums, but also in our classroom. And of course, I started with a lot of uh, questions and some of those questions, um, I'm going to put them out there. And speaking of questions, you can write, if you have initial questions in the Q&A, you, you can write them in the Q&A chat. And I hope we get to answers, uh, some of them throughout the webinar, and we can revisit them during the Q&A at the end. So while you think and write, you can put them in the chat. Let me share some of my own questions. Um, these are questions I started with or that emerged in my work with language teachers and museums. You'll see that some are practice focused questions, others might be driving research and teaching in the teacher education program I work at. Um, and some questions might be more aligned with a position as an art amateur, a museum visitor, an art maker. Um, so they're all out there. And as we progress in this webinar, I'll try to address them as well as your questions so that we can create pathways towards understanding and practices. So this is our itinerary for today's conversation in this webinar. Our goal is to connect with the material, the creative, the embodied dimensions of L2 learning and teaching by examining what we can learn from, at, and with the art museum. Um, our first stop is gonna be conceptual. We'll do a very quick review uh, and examine key multiliteracies concepts and pedagogy. 
And then once we've reviewed um, some of these ideas and practices, we'll turn to museums and ask you know, why museums, what is a museum? Then we'll explore museums and museum texts and their potential for L2 learning and teaching. Um, then connect this understanding with the learning opportunities afforded uh, by museums to multiliteracies approaches for L2 learning and teaching. Um, and then we'll proceed with um, some analysis of museum texts, sample activities for world language classrooms. And I will share some activities and some ideas uh, from you know, my own practice, but also from scholarship. And we'll end our tour um, on the possibilities for it to create, to discuss, to share ways to engage language learners with art museum texts, mostly art museums um, texts today. Um, and that would also be a practice oriented moment of learning. And I'll share some additional proposals um, for you to think of, maybe adapt or adopt. A um, couple of tools for us, actually just one main tool for us to uh, think and maybe grapple together with some ideas. Uh, we'll be using the chat. There'll be about three moments when we can take a break and, and answer some questions. Um, so that's the plan. And there will also even have a cup of tea because I know it's it, we're all in different time zones. So that's the plan for today. All right, so let's start with a, an examination of the notion of multiliteracies. We'll talk mostly about design and about multi um, pedagogies. So I'll go over these a little quickly because we'll explore them in more detail with examples uh, later in the, in the webinar. So here are some conversations on multiliteracies that may inform our discussion today in this work. The work of the New London Group and Cope and Kalansis is really foundational because it addresses the why, the what, and the how of multiliteracies pedagogies as social practices. Um, and this work is framed most of the pedagogical and conceptual projects on multiliteracies by really defining what it is, why it matters, for whom, and how do we go about doing that. So it was first published in 96, but it's very prevalent and relevant. I understand that uh, there will be an updated version published in 2023, and the visual that you have on the right attempts to capture um, the, the thinking process um, and that multiliteracies involves multiple forms, right? That is modalities, the possible transpositions uh, across them. So we have text from text, image, space, objects, body, sound, and speech, as well as multiple situations that they call life worlds. Uh, the symbolic, material, and embodied dimensions of multiliteracies. So it's a, an expansion of the what and why of multiliteracies pedagogy that includes multiple modalities, situations, and dimensions, but also a strong justice and equity stance. So there are some new questions like this one that um, Cope and Kalenza's forthcoming are putting together in a quote, in this interpretation of the dynamics of today's capitalism, how do we create a literacy pedagogy that promotes a culture of flexibility, creativity, innovation, and initiative, end of quote. So this orientation towards action, justice, social transformation, and a more general humanizing of pedagogies is already very present in the 96 publication, uh, designing social futures, but it's certainly amplified in other uh, publications like Paul and Roswell, uh, Rosell, sorry, um, but also Mira and Garcia, who also take uh, multiliteracies and literacies towards democratic engagement and social change. So to sum up, um, we see pedagogies of literacies being concerned with design for sure, there's quite a lot of research in that aspect, with multimodalities, 
a multimodality with an ex extensions um, for growing interest in modalities and their transpositions beyond the visual, um, thinking of bodies based sounds, smells also. And the two inflections that could orient um, future work is towards revisiting and expanding the participatory, the emancipatory, and the speculative dimensions of multiliteracies, pedagogies. So these directions and inflections, they're of course very present in the ways multiliteracies are envisioned in word language classrooms. You have here um, a part of the definition of literacies by Rick Kern. Um, important to note at the start of this webinar that we that literacies are seen as situated practices, so situ situated historically, culturally, symbolically, that um, literacies involve the creation and interpretation of meaning through text. So meaning making practices in dialogue and interaction with texts. And that literacies are variable and dynamic. Meaning is constantly in the making, changing across discourses, communities, cultures. Um, so when we're thinking about multiliteracies in the world language classroom, we're thinking of interpretation, meaning making, and dialogic engagement with text, but also collaboration to make sense together through dialogic interaction. Um, we're thinking about interpretive and creative meaning making processes that can take place through um, language use and other semiotic modes um, and builds on cultural and discourse knowledge. Um, and while participation to meaning making as situated practices is crucial, so are reflection and self reflection leading towards awareness and engaging meta-linguistic awareness processes as well. There are a lot of other publications that um, we're, we're gonna talk about, but I wanted to frame our conversation today around these. Um, I'll go briefly and then I'll come back to that um, on the how-to in the classroom later in the, in the presentation, but quickly, when we're thinking about the how-to of the pedagogies of multiliteracies, the visual on the left side of the screen is sort of recap of the different moments of learning or knowledge processes that can be activated. You see four of them on the left uh, visual of exploring familiar and, and unfamiliar meanings, connecting meanings through interactions with text, analyzing and investigating meanings in context <clears throat> and creating new meanings and texts. Okay, so there are of course challenges and questions. For example, um, how can we enact? How can we animate a pedagogy of multiliteracies? Or how can we expand our own and our students' sociopolitical imagination? And so we'll come back to that in part three. And if you have questions at this point, you can also put them in the Q&A. I think the most pressing question you must all want to ask is what about the museum? So we're coming to this uh, next. Okay, so remember, uh, we did a brief examination of key multiliteracies concepts and pedagogy, and now we're moving on to explore um, museums describing and attempting to define them. So our main question is, what is a museum? Um, so let's start with maybe um, a little bit of interactivity. <laughs> um, and I'm wondering if you could enter into the chat what the word museum can does evoke to you. And I have four suggestions. Um, but try to go ahead and consider them. Let us know. I think your suggestions are resonating with people, but I've also seen uh, conversation, culture and education, um, archives, ways of connecting culture. Culture is coming up multiple, multiple times. Yeah. Uh, so that one seems to be key. Uh, interactive experience, um, coloniality, mm -hmm. conservation. That's an interesting tension there between those two. Um, a contained space where creativity is expressed socialization, cultural literacy, mm -hmm. uh, opportunities, history, stuffiness sometimes, 
curated <laughs> knowledge, uh, framing the meaning of artworks and how they relate, human visions, invitations to encounter, imperialism, knowledge, mm -hmm. immersion, power dynamics, education and culture, awareness. Nice. Culture's coming up a lot again. Community, okay. enjoyment. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, oh, quite nice. a range. Well, thank you. This is this is really, really neat. So it's um of course, the museums are often considered as elitist, um, with power and privilege and serving an educated, wealthy, monolingual, powerful elite. So museums do evoke power and privilege. Coloniality is one of them, too. Um, museums are, sure, often seen as places of knowledge and culture with a capital C or lower a C, but so relatively closed spaces um, and as I mentioned like for museums can be quite inaccessible or appear quite inaccessible sometimes um, we can't see ourselves in the museum collections right the voices the narratives the bodies that are silenced or marginalized uh, certain collections in particular the so in the so-called universal museums so the Met the Louvre uh, museum um, like the big ones that were created and the collections were constituted through violence, coloniality and oppression um, and navigating being in such spaces and collections can um, be harmful, triggering in some ways also. Um, the education part, I mean, it, it is part of the mission of museums, but it, it can be perceived as transactional, right? Museums have knowledge, they have authority and power, they transmit to visitors by direct lecture or information. Um, and then as a visitor, you acquire knowledge through contemplation. And the role of museums as engaged actors in local global communities, um, it doesn't always come through. It's one of the most important ones. And this is changing and we're gonna see that how. So one of the things that we are going to do through the next two or three couple of slides and, and today is to revisit the museum to expand our understanding of what museums are, um, what they do, and to explore together what we can do together with museums from a multi-literacies perspective. So here is another little brainstorming um, activities. We're going to think of a definition of a museum in one sentence. Um, so the sentence starter would be, a museum is that does what for whom with the goals of, um, for what or for what purposes. And so I'll give you a couple of seconds to write that down follow up on the great ideas um, that were generated previously. So we've got a couple coming in. So a museum is a space that provides access for the accomplishments of the past mm -hmm. for, for the contemporary audiences as an addition. Nice. Um, a museum is a place to learn and reflect that offers artifacts for the community with the goal of opening one's mind, learning about past, present and future. Mm -hmm. We engage in the community with our culture and knowledge, and this is the museum. So a community place that offers works from different cultures for everyone with the goals of sharing culture and educating. Uh, a history that shares experiences and actions of the past for those interested in learning. A space that provides visitors with information on the cultural heritage with the goal of enhancing the knowledge of the visitors. Um, the museum is a space that collects texts of different kinds and is a text itself for people to interpret and make meaning with the goals of learning, connecting, imagining, and being human. Mm, that's a good one. Uh, a museum is a curated collection of things that connects people with ideas, wow. a collection of different forms of knowledge that provides interactive and formative op opportunities for interested audiences with the goals of enhancing their knowledge. Uh, so I'm seeing right away a lot of overlap with some of the terms that came up in the yes. initial brainstorm. Yeah. Nice. Well, thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Do you want me to uh, grab a couple more or keep going? I think we can keep going and we can Perfect. return to them um, at the next stage. I wanted to, for us to look at what the museum prof professionals do think about what a museum is and, and what it what they do. Um, so here is the definition from 
the 2007 definition of the museum uh, as it was adopted by ICOM members, so the International Council of Museums. And so the definition is the museum is a nonprofit permanent institution in the service of society, its development, it's open to the public. And um, what it does is it acquires, conserves, researches, communicates, and exhibits. Uh, tangible and intangible heritage of humanity and its environment for the purpose, the purposes or the goals of education, study, and enjoyment. And so I hear, you know, some similarities with the definition. This is like a long, a quite long definition. Uh, there's some similarities and some differences with uh, what, what we brainstormed earlier. Um, I think there's some overlap, maybe, if we can do that jump with our mandate as foreign language education. Um, I see communication, education, research expertise, um, but perhaps what is missing that was in some of your definitions that you submitted, but it's I don't necessarily see in that 2007 definition, are the dimensions of power and privilege, uh, perhaps also advocacy, community, uh, civic engagement. And since um, 2019, this definition has been under review. Um, the ICOM members have decided to propose a new definition of the museum. And before we move on to that, just a few notes. Um, there are, of course, all kinds of museums around the world, right? Aquariums, uh, science museum, natural history museum, uh, ethnographic, anthropological museums, um, botanical gardens, virtual museums. So all of all of these different types of museums, each with specific collections, specific objects, um, perhaps specific challenges as well in their history um, or even in their interactions with local communities. Um, and so all, all of that, all of these different uh, institutions are taken into account into that definitions. There are also all kinds of activities at the museums. Education is one of them. It's in the definition, but there's also research and many other in collecting, um, acquisition, conservation, research. There are also many different objects to cons uh, in museum collections. The objects are really not static. They have many stories to tell. Um, and the objects that are interpreted in museums, um, the museum itself can present different narratives. Uh, visitors could bring in interpretations, point of view. And so we'll see how it's kind of moving away from the authoritative cur curatorial voice. Um, but also we have to recognize that museums tell a story and then to take into account who tells the story and for whom. Um, there is a move towards a dia dialogic intent to be inclusive of voices, identities, perspectives, and positionalities uh, of visitors. Um, but in those objects also, they tell stories about specific time, specific place, but they also transcend time, right? Um, because objects in museums, they speak across boundaries and they, but they also reflect time and space. And so we seem, we're heading towards a definition or a description of museums are dynamic and diverse. Museums are changing um, and it's their missions, their roles and responsibilities. And so let's, let's continue to, to think about what uh, the museum professionals have um, thought of as their new definition. Because remember since 2019, they've been in the process of re-envisioning uh, who they are and what they do. So here's our last little brainstorming um, moment. Um, so during the campaign to revise and clarify its definition of the museum, ICOM invited multiple contributions from their members and collected a lot of possible new definitions, the same way we've been engaging and doing that in, in the chat. Um, and so um, 
I'll also share a link because beyond the, the six that I, the five that I suggested here, they're like over hundreds and hundreds um, in multiple languages, which is also quite uh, interesting to explore as language educators. So I'm just going to ask of the five that you see here, um, which one do you like best? And you can just enter a number. I want to give people a chance to read, but I'm seeing some patterns yeah. emerging already, which is interesting. <laughs> <laughs> so it really is a small sample. Uh, they have over 500 on the website um, that I can perhaps put in the chat as well, in case people are curious, want to go check it out. So I'm seeing a range of responses, but there's definitely a clear preference amongst this group for one and three. Mm. But every one of them has at least one vote. So there is there is a range as well. That's neat. I think I chose them also because, thank you everyone. And thank you, Chantelle. I chose them also because they each have, I think some elements um, that can make us think a little bit about the changing role and where we could go. So let's see. Okay, so let's see some of the inflection points, right, in the definition and description of what a museum is or could be. In our small sample, uh, we have ideas that museums are, could be institutions, um, have to do with preserving heritage, um, community spaces, for critical dialogue and civic engagement, civic and cultural partners, but also places of inquiry and safe spaces. I think that's um, among the five definitions. And here is what um, the new definition of the museum is. It was officially voted by ICOM in November, 2022. That's um, what they came up with and so, a museum is a not-for-profit permanent institution that doesn't change in the service of society. Um, what changed uh, is open to the public, accessible and inclusive, that museums foster diversity and sustainability. The term ethically, communicating ethically, entered the definition and with the participation of communities. Um, education is still there. Um, there's also reflection and knowledge sharing. And so I think the that's our new that's the new definition sort of expanded of what museums are and do. And it's also quite interesting to look at the process and the research um, and the to arrive at this definition. And because also it illustrates meaning making and the negotiation of the mean the meaning of what the museum is on really a global scale. And there are several phases of the survey and quantitative analysis, and you can check out the reports. It's quite, quite interesting for language educators and researchers. So yeah, new terms, sustainability, ethically, knowledge sharing, accessible, inclusive, and the participation of communities. So there are some, Inflection points, right? Also that we see from the museum literature with the strong desire to reconnect with audiences, with communities, sometimes repair these connections um, after the peak of the pandemic, but also after centuries of oppression. Um, dialogic and participatory dimensions to better address um, relational ethics to share curatorial and interpretive authority. I think that read, there's a lot about that in the museum education and museum literature. Also inflect practices um, to expand ideas around collections as resources, to bring more, more people in, um, and I imagine to foster new generations of museum professionals who would be attuned to today's challenges um, and the possibility of curating and educating otherwise. Um, also the, the desire to co-create new meanings, include new objects in the collections. And so I thought it was interesting and you can think of how close this definition is to your favorite one from the poll. There's always a problem uh, or a difficulty with uh, definitions more than descriptions because 
they don't always include the full range of experiences of subjectivity, materiality, affordances, or practices. Um, but I, I think it's interesting to like for us to kind of begin to change or to expand our understanding of what museums are and what we could do um, with museums. So this is also an invitation to revisit the museum. Um, we can include, to, uh, in addition to those two definitions, we can include a view of museums as short sure, institutions, um, but also dialogic uh, spaces for learning and for meaning making. Um, someone mentioned the museum as text uh, and as a composition of text. Um, we could also see the museum as a third space um, for literacy, um, learning and teaching. Um, and also as the museum potentially, depending on um, the, the museum, as a sociocultural actor um, in, implicated in public life towards change. So we can expand this way. When another layer of revisiting for us would be revisiting our relationships with museums, uh, possibly as educational partners towards justice, equity, and change. Um, as we're thinking of our own multilingual classrooms of, as uh, safe spaces to ask questions, to co-construct and share knowledge, to engage in collaborative dialogue and inquiry, our, our classrooms, and we can extend that to um, museum spaces as yeah, spaces of inquiry, meaning making, critical dialogue. We can also think of um, our role as activists for the promotion of equity, social justice, and multilingualism, um, and um, cultural agents of change, which I'm sure the museums as institutions, several of them are also rethinking um, their positionality, their collections, and their practices. So there are some convergences, I would say, um, at the institutional level, right? Like museums and higher ed, we're already moving towards expanding roles and models, affirming commitments to community, to democratic um, education, to equity and social justice. And um, some convergences also in education, particularly in language education, because we've known for a long time that remaining in silos is, uh, can be detrimental to our students, to our work. So like reaching out, expanding, getting new perspective, new maybe learning from um, museum practitioners um, could be uh, beneficial and we could really learn from and with each other. And so this is one of the points that I wanted to illustrate in this webinar. Um, and so next, we'll discuss uh, connections between multiliteracies, museums, and L2 teaching and learning from a pedagogical angle. Um, if there are any questions, I think we can. That's a good time to take maybe one, or I'm happy to to continue. I'm wondering because the questions that have come up are actually about the pedagogical connection, so okay. maybe it makes so, sense to hold off on those. Yeah. Yep. That way we can come back to them after that part of the webinar. Sure. Thank you, Shanta. Okay, um, so let's connect multiliteracies and museum for L2 learning and teaching. And we'll talk uh, about essentially about design and multimodality today. Looking for connections, um, imagination did seem like a salient one, a relevant one. Um, moving towards expanding our social imagination in education. And that's the quote from Maxine Green in blue on the left. Um, but also in language education. And that's the quote by Claire Cramps and Purple on the right. I see them, uh, those two ideas as invitations to push beyond the status quo and to move towards uh, reimagining the future of language education um, with our students. And as we're thinking about connections between museums, multiliteracies, and language teaching, here are some really good resources for, educa for educators. Of course, the book by Chantal Warner and Richmond Ambea is a fantastic resource. Um, it is also open access, so you can consult it um, at the link here. 
Um, I've also included a really non-exhaustive sample of papers that describe some pathways at with and through the museum, uh, often the art museum actually, for um, the L2 classroom. So the potential of museum and museum objects for generating intercultural dialogue has been highlighted by museum educators um, and by language educators alike. And on the museum sides, there are new approaches to exhibition design, to interactive materials, to self-guided tours and educational outreach. So I've really started to transform uh, what we could think of as the dusty aisles of art and artifacts into more vibrant um, learner-centered spaces. And in parallel, educators have also established curricular um, theoretical convergences between the arts, museums, and the 21st century classroom. But there's been less written on successful collaborations between um, different groups, um, but we'll continue to explore the enormous potential of museums and museum text to get an idea of ways to synchronize these efforts, to develop new approaches, activities, to learn, to combine practices and to smooth out some practical concerns. Okay, so we're gonna spend a little bit of time um, on this slide because we are now look, looking or examining possible avenues for multiliteracies at and with museum texts. So thinking of museums as texts and as spaces of meaning, meaning and meaning making. So keeping in mind these orientations and the possibilities of multiliteracies pedagogy, we can envision um, several pathways in terms of um, the dimensions of multiple literacies. Museums do address linguistic, cognitive, sociocultural, and multimodal ways of learning. It is uh, less linear than what we do in our language classrooms because a museum visit doesn't necessarily have the same beginning and end points. We can wander in different um, areas, encounter different texts, um, and come out with um, different kinds of trajectories. Um, but visitors can, of course, experience museums across multiple modalities. Yeah, we find texts, but also objects, um, sounds, uh, very present in exhibitions these days. Um, not always, it depends, right? If you're sensitive to this. Uh, speech, of course, right? When you, whether you're taking a tour or listening to an audio guide, um, but there are also embodied experiences at the museum. So experience and engagement with text are represented, interpreted, negotiated, um, resisted. Uh, along symbolic, embodied, and material dimensions. We talked about those <clears throat> at the very beginning. These experiences, of course, um, are mediated in different ways at the museums, and um, visitors can decide if and how they want to engage with specific text, but also with mediational tools, right? You can take a tour with an educator, you can um, use an audio guide online, um, with a group, by yourself, uh, for a specific, very open duration um, as well. <clears throat> so there is also some literature, as I mentioned before, um, both from museum scholarship and from language education that outlines possibilities for intercultural dialogue with text, and especially at the art museum. The notion of design is very central <laughs> to the work of museums. Curators and educators design exhibitions, write catalogs, conduct research. Um, the space of a museum is itself is designed and redesigned um, for collections and for a specific exhibition sometimes. And so are learning trajectories, learning and, and experiences. Criticality is also addressed uh, or can be addressed in interpretation and in engagement with texts. Uh, the agency of uh, visitors and mediators um, can be promoted in different ways through engagement. It's not always uh, museum 
centered, it, it can be more distributed. Um, and so agency, we can begin to see it uh, designed or taken into account and centered also in relation to the collections and to the spaces themselves. And finally, as we've seen with the changing definition of museum, there is space for participatory engagement and the design, the design of future collection, curation, interpretation, inclusivity, sustainability with and relationships with communities, co-design, dialogue, and critical engagement. I think it also depends how uh, museums are putting this in place, but also how we uh, write those notions into our practices at the museum. Um, so what we could see is uh, how we could explore these nodes and possibilities and what this could mean for language education. Um, going back, and now I'm talking about the little, um, the image on the right. So going back to our initial multiracies moments or knowledge processes, we can see that they can all be explored um, in the same way, maybe in even like more ways at, with the art museum. And so what you see, the multiliteracies aspect at the art museum with explore, connect, critique, and create. Um, this is bringing together um, pedagogies of multiliteracies with Serafini's visual, lit literal, sorry, visual literacy processes and practices. And I've also added some descriptions by Alan and Clementi to describe what we could do um, and co-construct for each process. All right, so when experiencing familiar and new meanings, when engaging with museum text, right? That's the engagement part. We can, we can ask uh, learners, okay, what do you see and feel? to facilitate the immersion in and the expression of embodied subjective multimodal ways of knowing. When targeting connections and conceptualization and making sense of meaning together, we can ask, what do you think of? Um, and this is a bit different from the critique um, or the, uh, the critique um, knowledge process where we would analyze, discuss, investigate meaning. And so targeting cognitive and linguistic um, dimensions by asking, what do you think? And, and when targeting connections and conceptualization, sorry, I skipped, uh, and making sense of meaning, that's when we ask, what do you think of? Um, and that's a bit different um, from the critique. And then the creative redesign of meanings and text there are a lot of possibilities here and we can ask ourselves and our students, okay, so how could we use and transform this text? Either through different modalities um, and for teachers, it would be thinking of ways we can create learning experiences using specific text and engage our students with the text multimodally, for instance, for example. Um, finally, in some of the activities that we can um, design and think about, um, we could include walking, because walking at the museum, and I'll give you examples, sketching, journaling, among others for explore, uh, mapping, and so mapping, mapping concepts, mapping connections, mapping aesthetic encounters through um, aesthetograms, for example, map uh, maps of aesthetic experiences and moments during a walk at the museum, drawing photography um, as well for connecting. Okay, so this um, I think sums up or like tries to look at the possibilities and together in the next, um, we'll talk a lot more about design. But before we do, I think I would like to um, take a short, different, go on a different pace and get to meet, um, get to have a cup of tea. Let's let's go and have uh, a nice cup of tea. And that's um, a video um, of an artist uh, that we're gonna look at together. I think we'll, um, we'll look at this to illustrate um, 
the explore, connect, critique, and create learning processes that we saw in the visual, um, I wanted to invite you to join Yasmin Jahan Nupur at the Tate Gallery in London for a nice cup of tea. So let's um, let's watch this together. And as you watch, please try to take notes, mental notes, written notes, whichever notes you want, of the various elements of uh, multiliteracies, or at least the how-to, that are animated through the performance and the associated research that was conducted by Nupu. And we can think in terms of criticality, interculturality, mediation, multimodality, cognitive, linguistic, sociocultural dimensions. Um, here we go. Thanks for coming here. Thank you. Please sit comfortable. Sit here. Okay. Feel free. This is your home. Thank you. How are you? Would you like to have tea? Yeah, yeah, for sure, for sure. <laughs> the work is called Let Me Get You a Nice Cup of Tea. You can see it's a very simple piece, and the project talked about the tea, opium, and textile. The conversation can be very personal, the conversation can be very private, the conversation can be very political. It's totally free, you know. So where do you live? I live in Bangladesh. Okay, cool, cool. I have a small garden mm -hmm. and we have a lot of uh, herbs as well. So uh, here I actually uh, made for you 11 tea. All are handmade and all actually came from my garden. And there is a four recipe maybe I took from a tea garden, mm -hmm. like actual tea leaves, not herbs. <laughs> <laughs> tea is a very, very related with our daily life. But we, we don't know the history, uh, how actually tea come in our cup. And it's very much interesting to talk with different people from the, all around the world. your opium napkin to just pick one yeah i think i want this one one at the bottom is it thank you big one is it? <laughs> <laughs> about tea because it's very much not part of my culture <laughs> yeah your culture is uh, coffee, coffee culture This is lovely, by the way. Thank you. Is it? Mm -hmm. You like it? Mm -hmm. Very nice. I was curious about this because I can see a lot of things that seem very interesting, and I wanted to ask you a little of bit about course, it. You can ask That's me any any questions. The map they drawn uh, 1886. So that map talked about more uh, British imperialism in all over the world at okay. that time. And then I chose the fabric because we had the 200 year British uh, rule. I think we lost a lot of artisan, a lot of craft, a lot of uh, plant. All right, I didn't know that. <laughs> yeah. I think it's very important to uh, do performance in the London talking about the British colonism history. There is also a lot of brutal history and violence. Immigrant uh, worker, tea worker, for me is, is also very connected, you know, to bring here in a cup and talk about, about the worker uh, same time. It was really interesting hearing you talk about the history of tea. Because I guess for me, being from the Caribbean, obviously there's such um, a difficult relationship with sugar mm. over there that I think for me, and obviously in Britain, sugar and tea is such like a correlated thing. They go hand in hand. You can see uh, the wallpaper also drawn by 
sugar and tea color. So on the history is a sugar coating already. Of course, yeah. Yeah. Most of my work is research-based work because I like to research on object. I think object also has the memory because someone touch it, maybe someone use it for the long time. And, uh, and object also, of course, has the history. All objects are related with, uh, with daily life. I try to make it homely environment uh, to the people because I feel that uh, it's also very, uh, very difficult to people to sit in the gallery, you know, it's, it has to be very brave people. I learned a lot from people because so many people has the knowledge and so we share the knowledge, we share the space, we share the time, even we share the memory. I try to make a friendship. Thanks for coming, thanks for sitting with me. I think it was a really nice um, moment and a really nice time for us to listen and participate in this performance. Um, I've I've heard and I've seen a lot of um, think of comments in the chat. Um, I think it's really interesting how in her work and especially in this performance, Nupu addresses how British colonialism, mass production globalization really pervades South Asian cultures in everyday life, right? Um, the performance itself is really reflecting the research work that she conducted, uh, diving really deep into meaning and meaning making practices. And it's a shared experience through performance, right? There are multiple modes of knowing and accessing, accessing meaning. Language is one of them, but fibers, uh, visuals, materials are also part of the conversation. And um, Nupur actually chooses to engage in conversation and in meaning making with the audience members in an environment that she created and that feels like home, like safe. But she also mentioned that like, you need to be brave to move into those spaces. Um, so through conversation, observation, we can begin to notice the materiality of the meanings that she wants to convey. We start to listen, to engage, to look, to see, to feel, and all of that in dialogue and in conversation with the designer of this experience. And the performance starts with the everyday practice of tea drinking and through dialogue, through interactions with objects, with texts, um, with embodiment and voices, it starts to move sometimes through interaction and emerges towards interculturality, criticality, and the emergence of new meanings, right? So this, uh, those different moments that we mentioned in the multiliteracies, uh, the pedagogy of multiliteracies, that, and that starts with examine, uh, um, um, connect, critique, and create. I think there are all all of these moments uh, potentially are there in that uh, short video. And so we'll turn to the notion of design within a pedagogy of uh, multiliteracies, and then I'll come back to um, this beautiful piece. Okay. Um, so design, it's been extensively investigated as a central element to multiliteracies. And the goal of multiliteracies pedagogy for the non New London group um, is to support, and others, of course, is to support growth and learning, um, but also to enter in dialogue with others towards enactment of change, social, democratic, civic futures, and um, entering some speculative and transformative dimensions of this work. And these processes are facilitated through design, that is engagement with text, with others, with the world. 
Um, and the process uh, starts with examining available designs, then designing new meanings and texts. And when new meanings emerge, then these new meanings become new available design. It's the redesigned and the becoming available design. When examining available designs, we can pay attention to the meaning making resources that are available. So these resources can be representational, social, structural, um, contextual, intertextual, and ideological. Um, the designing process really has to do with transformation and what we do with available designs. So it can include revoicing, making sense through reading, viewing, writing, listening, manipulating, etc. And it's also um, a communicative process. It's languaging as well. And the redesign is when unique new meanings emerge and are created. So it's a transformative, transformational process and new available designs are created. And in that um, um, performance that was filmed that we just saw, let me get you a nice cup of tea, the available designs such as the familiar practice of drinking tea, the teapot, and engaging in conversations, um, but it also means paying attention to the meaning-making resources that are available prior to and during the performance. And that includes the materials, the objects, the space, um, the images, the, the needlework. And understanding the design process um, and what the artist in collaboration with an interlocutor can make sense of, but also transform these meaning make the meaning resources through dialogue. And in turn, it is possible that new meanings associated with tea, with tea drinking, with conversation, listening, talking to one another can be created in turn and in turn become available designs to participants, right? I, it's possible that um, participants left this experience with new, avail new meanings, new available designs, and that's about transformation, but it's also intercultural dialogue and criticality. And so when walking, learning and engaging with texts like this one or others at the museum, there, there are ways that we educator could use to facilitate this process. Um, this table um, summarizes some possibilities for engaging with museum texts by examining design elements uh, within a multi-literacy framework. So I'm still conceptualizing uh, some of the possibilities and permutations, um, but this is what I've been attempted to do up till now. And, and you can find a sample um, in the L2 journal paper uh, from 2018. And really it builds on the new London group work as well as Serafini's visual literacies among others. So um, when exploring, we're in the, with our students, we're exploring meaning. I like to focus on the social dimension of reception and interpretation. So we can examine the colors, the characters, the space in the museum, um, the mediation tools, but also the bodies, the movements in the space. And we can ask questions like, how do you feel? Or how does this text or the space make you feel? How do you relate and or connect with the characters if, they're, if it's figurative um, art text? Um, what emotions are conveyed and how do the characters in text interact or not together? Um, depending on the situation when I'm um, with a group and we're going to uh, museum, I usually try to move towards uh, making connections and addressing the contextual and intertextual dimensions of the text, right? We can interrogate a text in terms of genre, narratives, memories, um, and ask, Questions like, what do you think of? Or what other texts or stories do you associate with this text that we're looking at? Um, then we can move to analysis or not, or like, or do all of those um, 
separately at different times and different moments, depending on our learning objectives for the day. Um, and it, when delving into the, the uh, analysis, we, we can ask, what do you think? And we get more into the structure and the organization of the text. Um, and this is usually where we need a little bit more technical understanding or talking about multimodal en ensembles, about design processes and meanings of the text. And well, it often there are new meanings and interpretations that start to emerge earlier in the discussion, um, but it can also be built up through the analysis. Um, the critique part, right, is often merged with the structural analysis or with the analysis, the meaning, um, the analysis of the meaning, multimodal ensembles and, and different meanings there. Um, in at least in conversations in the galleries, because they often build upon each other. Uh, and so this is also where we can bring in notions of ideology or authorship, uh, discourse as well that are reflected in the text, but are also, um, they also shape our engagement with the text. And so we can have this reflection and self-reflection on that too. And the creative dimension or the creative, um, yeah, it does element or dimension, it doesn't need to come at the end. Uh, and often this is, it could also be an initial strategy of engagement with available designs through sketching, through photography and, with teachers, at least we often reach the creativity phase uh, by engaging in the transformation of the text, either by transforming the genre, the audience, the ling language, um, the context of the, mo the modalities, um, but also wondering how we can create with or alongside, but also sometimes against this particular text. So this is also where imagination and creativity are most stimulated, but once again, all those those moments um, uh, can happen, you know, at different, not necessarily uh, in the same, one after the other, sorry, that's what I meant. Okay, um, we're gonna do a quick example, right? Because I understand this is like a lot of information. Um, so let's, let's try to look at design and look at uh, an example. Okay, so we can think about possibilities. Um, and we start by looking at the image on the far, far right of the screen. The two small ones are just like blow up de details of the big, um, the big one. And we can start to explore the familiar and new meanings in this text. So I'll give you a few seconds to jot down some notes in the chat or in the chat or in piece of paper um, or to draw what you see in this text. So representational elements. I'm just gonna give a minute for people to, to process. Thank you. So we've got people visiting the museum. It's mm. part of this representational, but then also that it's that it's upper middle class. Mm. Uh, the construction of the museum. Ah, the globe representational of the Louvre, but also creative imagination dreams for the museum, perhaps. Ah, yeah. The, the, a facade of the museum, which has the, the lovely double meaning. <laughs> yes. So yeah, we see buildings, like we see people. We can infer that they might be visitors, might be doing something else, or construction. There's definitely some construction that seems to be going on. And we've located, um, we've determined that we're at the Louvre, so meaning Paris. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, so a couple people have mentioned class, which I think is interesting in terms of maybe getting us into the ideological a little bit. Yeah. Um, and then a dreamlike characteristic yes. of the visuals. Yeah. So that I think we're going to go into into that as well. Um, just a quick follow up question to what I uh, the the representational representational and the description basically. Um, what type of text or what genre do you think this belongs to? And I think it, it's going to go into what we're talking about with the dreamlike. I think it's it can be a little tricky to pinpoint. 
So definitely multimodal, which mm -hmm. is disturbing noted. Right. But theatrical, maybe announcement, propaganda, yeah. historical fiction. Interesting. Yeah, it is interesting. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> announcement, propaganda. Yeah, I like that. I think oh, revolutionary that's... people are commenting. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, those are good. Those are really good. Um, and then another one I'm ask, I'm wondering, do you see some specific meaning making elements in the text? We've talked about people, we've talked about buildings. What else? Lots of symbols people are saying. Okay, symbols, definitely. They're a little bit over the all over the image. Past and present coming together in one place. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think this is also going back to what we were saying about temporality at the museum, that really the objects like go beyond time and in mm -hmm. time. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. this is noting that there's there are direct messages also in addition to the, uh -huh. the ones that are more symbolic or allegorical, somebody said. Magical yeah, realism. Yeah. Yeah. There's also some direct like writing. And I don't know if anyone reads french or um but then there's also a list list of people and the term uh with the with participation of and then a list of names suivi de meaning like and also so sort of like a guest list of guest stars coming um that's pretty good. And how about the semiotic systems? Do you see visual references, spatial movement, gestures, linguistic, we've just mentioned, or symbolic, you also mentioned, uh, represented and used? So visual, for sure. I think people have mentioned that. So that seems to be the one that jumps out the most. Yeah. Uh, but people have noticed that there is also verbal text. Yep. And movement. Movement. There's a car on the mini truck on the right. Maybe um, the balloon as well. Yeah. The balloon as well. <laughs> uh, the space, right? Mm -hmm. Also, seems like there's along with movement, um, and symbolic and used. And then, last question When do you think this text was created? And what makes you think so? It's interesting to pause here because so many people have commented on the juxtaposition of past, present, and future. Yep. So there's something there that we catch, but then people, it's less certain maybe exactly when. Yeah, uh, something, I mean, it's, so. <laughs> it's hard to pinpoint. But let me let me uh, let me show you another visual. But this is yes, this is exactly where I was getting to. Um, <clears throat> okay, so looking at types of texts, right? Um, when you were thinking about public uh facing information this is indeed a poster it was posted on on walls but also of course on social media and websites <clears throat> it's the artist jr so jr uh presenting their work at the louvre museum and like there are some elements that were we were ident we identified the buildings the cultural land landmarks um the pay pyramid in the Napoleon courtyard of the of the Louvre Museum. There are people, the people are workers. It seems to be craftspeople, but also onlookers, and they're wearing contemporary dress. And I think some <clears throat> there were mentions of upper class bod, uh, dressed, or at least it feels this way. There are machines, there are car trucks, bikes, and a balloon. <laughs> uh, there are animals and the two monkeys at the bottom center. Uh, there are symbols, there's the Paris, among others, coat of arms. And there's written text with list of names on like drapes on the side and in French, but also the title with the two birds. Oh, I forgot the birds that are carrying the, the, the Gier au Louvre. There's the motto in French, ça va bien se passer. And in Latin, omnia bene evenient, uh, all will be well. And so all the different, we have visual um, references, we have spatial, movement, gesture, symbolic, language, et cetera. And so our question. So I put those two images uh, next to one another. On the left is a fragment, I mean a fragment, yeah, because it's been changed, reduced, of a 17th century charcoal drawing of the Tuileries Palace, which is, a uh, 
align with the Louvre, right? And so I, basically those two images, they could be facing each other. That would be the perspective architectural. Uh, and on the right, you ha we have the text that we've been looking at. <clears throat> and so it seems like the conventions and codes of the architectural drawing are quite similar. So there's, <clears throat> there's writing with people walking around. And on the right, we can see a vehicle, uh, we can see vehicles on both a carriage or a truck. Um, yes, there are some strange elements, right? In the poster on the right, the pay pyramid is from the 20th century. There's a van, there's a balloon. Um, and so the poster is from 2017. That's by artist uh, GR, who announced a performance in the courtyard of the museum. And all the participants who are listed on, in the drapes uh, at the bottom are actually represented in the drawing. The two monkeys, they refer to the pro production company of the artist, along with the, the bandeau in, in French. But there's also Latin in the 17th century drawings, for example. And so DR, the, the artist, he used and transformed some available designs. And I'm sure there are others that we can think of. Um, and created a new text, a redesign that in turn can become an available design for whoever wants to be um, picking this up. And it plays with the conventions of representation from the past, could be from uh, 17th century or others, uh, but using contemporary techniques. And so something, something else is interesting, the pyramid, there's construction as you noted, and the pyramid is being covered because there's a collage that is actually going on. And J.R. is actually a, a street artist. They started as, now he's like a global phenomenon, but uh, he started as a street artist and with collage on walls. Um, that is actually was his first um, big exhibition. And so um, could be an example of a redesign. The photo on the top left illustrates the performance that was announced by the poster. So the poster is before the performance and here you can see what it looked like during the performance. Um, JR created the illusion that the pay pyramid had disappeared by gluing and collaging images of the section of the building right behind, right? And so for that, the students uh, interpreted the poster as an invitation to the event. And so that is another way of creating an invitation. Um, and But there's also sort of a newspaper headline, oh, the pyramid disappeared, because then um, there was going to be an investigation um, and a report as well. And there's uh, also like a mix of references here. You can see there's a very 80s sign, bright pink uh, on the top right corner. Um, and it's also bilingual, and it's um, it's a proposal to work from JR's text um, and available designs, um, posing an alternative. So I see we have very little time left, um, but uh, let me quickly either you know we can. Um, I have some other examples that I can show you, or we can give some time for the Q&A. Chantel, you can tell me what you think would be best. How would you feel about one more example and then Q&A or? Okay. Yeah. So I'm going to move on and, um, okay. Talk to you about, um, about a, a little, couple of little examples, this time of like creativity, right? Um, so we're moving away from the analysis proper and that's sort of like opening up to creative explorations. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with this virtual museum, which is the Museum of Smiles, the Musée du Sourire. Um, and that's another way to go and explore. So we're at the explorer moment, the collections of a virtual museum. And this is the kind of explorations that we've been doing during um, COVID. Um, and also we could, we could all use a smile at that time. And um, so we, <clears throat> um, this is an exploration. Um, first, we discovered the rationale for creating a virtual museum of smiles. And so that's interesting to 
uh, conduct a search, to listen to the videos, to engage with the corpus of texts, um, but also to discuss mediation practices with online museum visits. Um, in this image, I used we use to address new meanings. Um, we learn from this image in the collections of that Museum of Smiles that there used to be a code, like meanings associated with the position of a stamp on a postcard. And so, in a language class, um, it's like if it's straightforward, uh, like here, it means like I'm thinking of you. Uh, if it's on the side to the left, it's I really think of you a lot. Or if it's on to the right, upside down, it says thank you. Uh, upside down is like wait for me. And so it's sort of um, interesting to explore. In a, and I think also with um, beginner at the beginner levels. Um, so it, and also to address the margins of this text, right? Because it's it's a Twitter feed. And so that's quite, uh, and we engage in like writing around in the margins around the text as well. And the annotations also become part of the conversation before creating a postcard and selecting meanings that we want associated with the position of the stamp. Um, very briefly, you might be familiar also, um, same of the, the work that was done at the Victoria and Albert Museum, another online collections uh, that is a virtual collection that is quite interesting to explore, especially as, and I'm sure everybody, it's the case for everyone, we're still building, rebuilding some connections um, with our students. And um, so the curators created Pandemic Objects, which is an online editorial project that gathers, get, they gathered and compiled objects um, that have taken on new meanings during the pandemic. And one of the examples is the rainbow. Uh, rainbow has multiple meanings. And during um, the lockdown in Britain, uh, but also in Italy, we see a, a photograph from um, Italy, everything will be okay with rainbows. The care, the care bears associated with that. And there's a landscape with a John's Constable painting with rainbows and all the other multiple meanings, but um, new meanings started to emerge um, during the pandemic. And it's it's a great website for resources to, to explore. Um, and then um, that's another first for fun one. So, um, what we talked about embodiment, talked about looking and walking. And so um, thinking of walking and mapping as creative practices, um, I like to use Yoko Ono's uh, map directions uh, as a way to release our creativity and imagination, but also as a way to turn around the textual genre of the map, uh, draw a map to get lost. Like the, her book is a set of directions and then they're uh, interesting to explore. And you can try this at home because it's fun. And I'm going to stop here. Um, uh, so we've got the poll popping up there. Um, and while people are completing that, I'm going to thread in a couple of questions because you honestly started already answering, I think, the main one that was coming up. Um, so people <laughs> were asking about um strategies for integrating the this this idea of bringing the museum in alongside all the other obligations and then specifically about what about virtual opportunities as one way to create a different kind of access even recognizing that because it's mediated in a different way that that experience is also going to be is going to be different in some ways so i'm just going to invite you maybe to comment a little bit more on on how you see that yeah, um, so that I wanted to include also some virtual museums uh, because we've all been doing a lot of that. Um, and so I personally really enjoy the materiality and the sensory dimension of being able to, in certain ways, manipulate objects or the being together in a space looking carefully and slowly at the same item, which I think can be reproduced in a classroom um, as well. Um, 
And I also know that there are some challenges with taking students to the museum, uh, perhaps even more so, but it's there's a lot of logistics involved. Um, it can be expensive, there's some travel. It's not always easy to do. So a couple of things. Um, museums, and at least in Philly and some other museums I've worked with, they have some packets that they can of reproductions of objects plus lessons. Um, that they can send and to to schools, and that is a very easy process. I mean, I'm sure it takes a couple of weeks to figure it out, um, but there's a possibility of accessing some some of the collections um, from various museums with educational packs um, directly from the museum. So that is one way. Um, of course, you know, it takes time to sort of to design learning experiences and um, with muse with museums or museum text, right? They're clearly involved like getting being engaged with them uh, regularly. Um, but one of the outcomes of the closure of museums and schools is that we have access to a lot of um, collections across the world. There are actually some new museums that are um, being created, some others that are struggling, right? It's not the same for everyone. Um, but then we can together access um, databases, but also virtual collections that were created specifically for virtual visits. And so that could be useful too. I don't know if it answers the question. I think it does. I think that's really, really helpful. You're getting, um, and I know we're going to need to wrap up here, but you're getting lots of um, really nice compliments and people oh, saying how helpful this was that we're going to make sure you get. And, and I just wanted to say, I really appreciate that in your approach, it really brings in the kind of curated and designed element, but also a reminder that there's a lot of multi-literacies and meaning that's undetermined and that is dynamic and full of movement. And so this focus on the museum, whether physical or virtual, I think really just adds something powerful beyond just focusing on the visual, which is something I think we've done better as language educators in a lot of ways. Um, so please do know we're going to be sharing the slides, the video recording will be up. Some people were already saying they'd like to go back and, and look at some parts of that. So we'll have that as an offer. Um, and maybe we'll all have a book club and we'll read Christelle's book when it comes out yeah. as well. <laughs> yes, it would be lovely. <laughs> oh, and thank you for the additional references um, in the chat. Really appreciate it. Yes, thank you to everyone who shared something. Um, and yeah, so please join me. I'll be the only one who can clap aloud, but I know you're all <laughs> clapping alongside of me virtually. Um, join me in thanking Christelle for this wonderful webinar and for all these thank, great ideas. Thank you for having me and thank you for this really great moment that we've spent together. It was wonderful. Thank you. <laughs> and we'll keep things open just a little bit longer for people who are still working on the poll or, or offering their thanks, but. It's great to have you all here today. I enjoyed the tea. <laughs> the tea. Oh, yeah. I thought it would be nice to have tea together, but it's very <laughs> thought provoking. And I think it lingers with us for uh, hopefully beyond the, the time that we spent together. Um, it's this beautiful. It's a really amazing piece. And I also wanted to bring in a lot more contemporary um, uh, art or texts. It's like, Gravi naturally gravitate more around them, but I also think in terms of like the the thought provoking or like the that that has impact and do it and the design work there is yes very impressive the research. <laughs> I know we had language educators, but also museum educators in our audience oh, today too. So wow. <laughs> <It's exciting>. oh. <laughs> cool. Oh, nice. I see some comments in the text. They're open. Well, yes, I'm glad that we got to travel um, to your home together. <laughs> we'll make sure you get a copy of these as well so that you have it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> it's also so nice like that we got together and everybody is in such different spaces, different places. Well, I can't wait to hear what the wonderful the wonderful work that everyone is doing in their classes well thank you so much we're gonna let you go get a real tea now if you would like <laughs> yes <laughs> thank you very much have a wonderful 
um, I think afternoon and lunch. Afternoon here, but yeah, for everyone else who knows. <laughs> different time zone. Thanks. Thank you All so right. much. Take care.